Welcome back to the Tapes Archive podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. In this episode, we have the Red Rocker Sammy Hagar. At the time of this interview in 1997, Hagar was 50 years old, freshly out of Van Halen, and promoting his new album, Marching to Mars, and his upcoming tour. In the interview, Hagar talks in detail about how he saw the breakup between him and Van Halen, his dislike for manager Ray Daniels, and his new musician, best buddy, Mickey Hart. This week's interview is hosted by Mark Allen. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. But, you know, given uh, given your affection for UFOs, I thought you'd be in Roswell, New Mexico this week. Well, you know, if I didn't have to play, I certainly would. I've been following that on the Internet. I've been following it in the newspapers. And, yeah, it's pretty trippy, you know. I'm not sure all that stuff came down at Roswell. I'm just, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit of a skeptical because there's so many hoaxers, and every time you turn around, somebody's putting up some little shop there and selling this and selling that. When all that happens, it kind of turns me off, you know, really bad. Let's talk about the music. That's the thing about this album that I guess uh, I did not give it a good review. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> the thing about this album that surprised me is you're not that pissed off. I, I expected a really angry album from you, and uh, and this isn't that angry. Well, you know what's weird is that in my life, if there's anything I've learned, it's that sometimes shocking change and something that you think is a you know really a horrible thing at the time can turn out to be the best thing ever happened to you. When this first came down, I was extremely pissed off for about two weeks. But as soon as I started writing and realizing that I had all the freedom in the world and I could I could write any kind of song I wanted and I didn't have to compromise anything, I got really happy. <laughs> and so by the time I recorded this record, I was in heaven, man. I was just, I can't tell you. I mean, I'm not angry anymore. I don't know what to be angry about. It's like, you know, I had 10 great years with Van Halen, one shitty year out of 10. Which, you know, if you've ever been in a relationship for that long and it ends, you know, it's usually, it could be even uglier than that, you know, so I, I just feel like I'm so much more creative now, I have so much more freedom, and nothing is better than being happy, and once, you know, you become happy, you realize nothing is worth taking your happiness away, and, uh, that last year was, that's what happened. I was miserable, so I felt like it was a springboard. Uh, but the thing about this record that I think probably may, maybe you didn't get, or maybe everyone else doesn't get, is that, you know, I've changed a lot since uh, since Van Halen. 11 years in that band will change you. I'm a better singer, I'm a better guitar player, I'm a better songwriter, I'm a better performer, and I'm a better person. I'm a wiser person, and I'm 11 years older. So the only negatives I've ever heard about in reviews in this record have been that I'm not the old Sammy Hagar, right? The old Red Rock of the Return. Everyone was expecting this, this little lightning bolt, you know. But I've changed. I ain't yeah. the same person, and I'm pr I'm proud of it, you know. And I, I personally think this is much more um, palatable and just more has more depth. My lyrics, my uh, my melody, my song structure. Uh, it's just got a lot more depth than I've ever had, so uh, I'm loving this record. Okay. Well, you, you've explained give yourself it a second. well. Okay. Yeah, give, give it a second listen. All right. <laughs> now, I'm looking up an old uh, quote, because we've, we've talked a few times before, and you said to me about Van Halen, these guys would have to cut my neck and throw me out of the band. Well, they did it. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't cut my neck. They stabbed me a couple times in the back and then threw me out. But is the story correct that you wanted to do some new material and they just wanted to do greatest? Is that uh, Absolutely. When we ended the tour, my wife was pregnant. We went away over to Maui. We were taking Lamaze classes and getting ready for a wonderful natural childbirth that we had it all worked out in April. Eddie was supposed to get hip surgery and Alex was supposed to get neck surgery. So instead they opted to go in the studio. And I said, well, maybe you guys can put your surgeries up. I can't make my wife unpregnant. You know? <laughs> so, uh, with, we start bickering, you know, they, well, you can be here when Michael Anthony was on the road when his baby was born, and I'm going, well, too fucking bad, you know, this baby's more important than a band or anything to me. The truth of the matter is, is Eddie and Alex weren't on the road when their babies were born, and uh, so, uh, because I don't live in L.A., it was difficult, because I, I kept traveling back and forth from Hawaii and spent three or four days with them, and I'd take some music back for me, and I'd write lyrics, and nah, nah, nah. so anyway, then all of a sudden, they spring it on me that June 1st is not the start date, because I kept saying, what the fuck is the hurry here? And they spring on me that June 1st is is not the start date. We're not going to start the record till September because we're trying to get these two songs that were supposed to be for the Twister movie. We're trying to get uh, get them done for the Greatest Hits record. And I'm going, I am not interested in doing a Greatest Hits record. I think it's the stupidest thing we could do. And 
you know, the new manager just totally sold this idea to Ed Now, who had been de If you read other reviews in the past, you'll find that Eddie was dead against the greatest hits record. It was like the last thing he wanted to do. Why put out a greatest hits record? Every record we've ever made is still available, and it's great, and I'm going, amen, you know. So the old guy comes in, I mean, the new manager comes in and, and wants a piece of the old material, but it was, a, it was a money scam from the manager. And so he comes in, he's the new guy in the block, Alex's brother-in-law, no less, and he wants a piece of the old albums, and we're saying, Oh, I'm saying, what are you, crazy? You think you can just walk into this multi-million dollar situation for yourself, and now you're going to want a bigger piece than anybody else? Like I told him, I go, I've been in the band 11 years. I've never even asked for any of the old material, you know, the, van, the old raw stuff that I've been singing for years. I'm going, that's crazy. That's theirs. And the 5150, you know, OU-82 era, that's ours. And you are from now on, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he actually put it together behind my back, got a piece of it from those guys, and sold it to Warner Brothers and got us this huge amount of money advance because they've been wanting to do a great hits figure for so long. And they just swallowed it. And I said, I, I, I will not do it. I won't make a new song for it. And so they got Roth to do it. It's that simple. And that now this guy manages the whole thing, and he's making a new guy walks in and makes more money than Sammy Hagar or Eddie Van Halen. From, from from that band. Can you imagine this? He makes more money than either one of us. You're talking about this extreme guy? Or, or no, you're talking about the, the brother-in-law. Yeah, yeah okay. the manager, wow. who also managed extreme. And he connived this whole thing. Then the Roth thing blew up. And then he throws his, his own singer in there who gets paid nothing. And now him and Eddie and Alex split all the money. And it's like, it's so greedy because I'm telling you right now, but I'm an extremely rich human being for my whole career, right? I would so, hope so. Yeah. And so are those guys. Yeah. And you don't have to do something like this for cheap. So before this guy came in, I can tell you, you've seen Van Halen. We all had the same dream. We all had the same vision, and that was to become the greatest rock and roll band in the world, stick, stick together forever, outdo everybody, never sell out, never be cheap. And one new guy comes into the mix like that, and this is why I'm not in the band anymore, and because I refuse to do it. And and I swear, you can call me a, you know, a liar, Eddie can say anything he wants. I'm telling you right now, it was all about greed and integrity. Do you wish this didn't happen in public? Yeah, except I want the fans to know what happened because I don't want them to think. I did like Roth and, and just quit because I thought I was hot shit and thought I could go out and just be a solo artist. That wasn't my intention. You know, I, I was pushed. No question about it. I didn't jump. I was pushed because I wouldn't go along with the program. I kind of want the fans to know what happened, but I wish it wouldn't be dragged, you know, back and forth through the, through the mud, you know, pulling me across first. And then I have to defend myself, you know, because Eddie and those guys went out and, and they flat lied about what happened. And... It, they drug me all through the mud, so then I got to drag them guys back through it, and now they're going to go out again with the if they ever get a new record done, and they'll go out again and drag me back through it, and I'll probably be out there two years from now saying, "Huh, defending myself again," but I hope I won't. But that's the part I don't like. The on and on and on. I think we all should have made one statement, and that should have been it. I was surprised that you thanked them on, on this album too. Well, you know, like I said, I know you had the ten good years and everything. Yeah, I got I just... happy. I, you know, you know. Yeah, have you ever fallen in love? Come on, Mark. Yeah, well, I've been, I've been married for for uh, what thirteen and a half years. So. Okay, but you know, but when you when you first fall in love, you right. know, it's like you get all this bubbly thing and you get all high and you think everything's okay. The shit that was bugging the hell out of you, you know, the week before that, you're going. Oh, that's no big deal. Right. <laughs> you know, somebody just stole my car. Oh, so what? I'll just get another one, you know? It's kind of like, that's the way I was when I, got, when I got out of Van Halen after I started really working on my records and feeling this wonderful freedom and uh, so much inspiration and stuff. I got so happy that I did stupid things like thank a mother. <laughs> I couldn't help it, man. I, I'm still feeling that way, you know, like fans, oh, God, they're throwing up these horrible banners on stage, you know, and I, and me, I'm a banner guy. I hold them up and everything, and, and I'm going, oh, shoot, you know, they're saying stuff like, you know, no, you know, fuck Van Halen. And I'm going, no, 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 stop it, you know, I'm, I'm still having, to, I'm having a good time out here. And the, the fans have been so supportive. This is the most, here, here we go again, here's why I'm also extremely happy, because 
I walk out on stage, like last night, it was only 2,000 people out of 3,000. I mean, I thought I could sell out a 3,000 seater anywhere in the world in five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Last, there's been two shows that have been what I call three quarter business, you know? Yeah. And uh, I'm going, wow. But the people are so, they're just hardcore Sammy fans. It's like my relatives are out there, man. It's like my cousins, my sisters, and aunts, and uncles, and, and nieces, and nephews. And it's phenomenal. I've never, ever walked out on stage to such a response and left the stage after two and a half hours to such an ovation in my life. Yeah, I, I, now this, this is all starting to make sense to me. You know, but, but I guess, I, you know, I was like, I'm, I, I'm, what, the new role, or one of the later latest Rolling Stones has something that starts off with, you know, Sammy Hagar's pissed or something like that. So I guess... Trying to make me pissed. Yeah. <laughs> Rolling Stone. You know, some journalists, though, you know, they'll get a hold of me on the subject and they'll get me going. And as I get going and I start digging into the manager... And then I start getting a little angry and I start talking about, you know, kicking people's ass and stuff. But truthfully, I'm not pissed. I'm disappointed is a much better word. I, would all, I will be disappointed for the rest of my life about what Ed now let this guy do. That is big disappointment. You know, these guys were my friends. We stood on stage. We were the best friends. We were the, you know, we had a blast. And... And to tell the fans now, you know, fuck that guy, fuck that guy, I'm embarrassed to say that because I'm just like saying, man, I'm not going to slap the fans around like that. Say, you dumbass people, you bought this shit, you know. I mean, that's kind of the way Eddie and Alex put it, you know, and uh, a couple of times. And I'm just going, this is, that part's really disappointing. But other than that, nah. Yes. No, I, I always thought, you know, I mean, uh, I, I know, known and watch you for a long time, and I mean, you know, you're the happiest man on earth, I think. And, I am. And, you know, to, to see what happened, I mean, when, I remember when somebody told me that this was happening, and I said, no way, no way is Sammy leaving Van Halen, and, and of course you didn't, you were, you know, you were forced out. But, right. okay, so uh, so what do you think these guys are going to sound like with, uh, with Gary Sharon? Uh, the word is from inside camp, you know, you, you see I, all those people that work for Van Halen, all those 35, 40 people right. are my friends as much as theirs. And I've stayed in contact with plenty of those people because they're true friends. I mean, we still have barbecues. They come to my birthday bash in Cabo and this so forth. And <clears throat> the word I got is that they're trying to sound like they're trying to make Gary sound like Sammy Hagar. I'm well, good serious. luck, but I'm I... <laughs> they got they, they keep putting the songs in higher keys until he can barely sing them, mm -hmm. so that he sounds strained and and like you know passionate like the way I sing, and I mean that may be the right thing to do. I have no idea until I hear it myself. I'm not going to pass judgment because you know Ed and Al are great musicians and they're capable of doing something great at all times. I know one thing though they lost their songwriter, mm -hmm. you know, because I was the songwriter in that band. Eddie Van Halen is a musician; he writes music, pieces of music, and but there's no melody, there is no lyric, and there is no song structure. It just uh, it's just like this big long piece of music, and and I was always the guy came in and said, okay, wait a minute, this sounds like a verse. Okay, let's repeat that here, and let's put the chorus here, and then we need a bridge, and then okay, Ed, you always need a guitar solo, so put that there. This beats, you know, you know, and then I would write a melody, and I would write lyrics, and make a song out of it, and that's why they have been in the studio since January 1, 1996, and they still don't have a record. It's because they just they don't have a songwriter, and so they hired this Mike Post guy, who's the jingles writer for TV themes. He's the guy who wrote Hill Street Blues. Yep. Theme and that. Oh my God. Yep. They hired him to produce the record and to co-write all the songs. <laughs> and so now, so Mike Post, I guess, is the lyricist. <laughs> who's a 72-year-old man? What he's got to say to the younger generation, I have no idea. But uh, that's what's going on, and that's who they've been in there with for you know since first this year and. I don't know. You know, they fired three producers trying to make this record already. So Glenn Ballard quit, actually, and, and uh, what's his name? Uh, Bruce Fairburn got fired when he finally told him after they had 17, Eddie thought he had 17 songs. He goes, you don't have one song. We need a song. <laughs> and, they, and they fired him. So then they brought in Mike Post, and uh, they've been with him for six or seven months. And so we'll see what happens. I have no idea, man. I hear rumors all the time about, you know, Alex's, and Alex was out, and then, you know, Gary Sharon's and Gary Sharon's out, and, you know, I, I hear all these rumors, but I, I try not to get too involved with it because it's like kind of, it does intrigue me too much, and I'm kind of a sucker. I'm like a cat, you know, the curiosity factor. If it, if it tanks, how will you feel, and if it's really successful, how will you feel, do you think? If it was bigger than what we did, uh, I would be kind of like, I feel bad. My ego would be a little bit 
take a little blow. It's kind of like what happened to David Lee Roth, isn't it? If that happened to me as well, then I would have to say Eddie Van Halen is the biggest star in the world because that's what would have to carry it. Uh, I expect it to go down a little bit, but if it really, really bombed, that would hurt me. I'd feel bad for them, and I would feel bad for the fans. And I just, I just feel bad that something that great, here we go again, I'd be so disappointed that something as great as what we had and as bulletproof as what Van Halen was. You know, Van Hagar era was bulletproof, man. We made it to grunge. We made it through all that shit. Nothing was fucking with us. We still had, we still sold like four or five million records and we still sold out concerts everywhere. <clears throat> so if they blew, if they ruined that, I would feel, you know, I'd feel bad. I'd think, gee, what a waste. So, someone should be hung by the balls for it. <laughs> yeah. well, and one more question about Van Halen. Yeah, when Michael Anthony was taking a bass solo, you ever take a nap? It was too short. <laughs> I wanted him to play longer. It never, it never seemed short when you were sitting in the audience. Let me tell you. Well, that's really weird. I know, but I, I feel bad for Mikey because see, he was the only guy in the band that's innocent. In all this, Mikey has never been a part of the band as far as sharing in the profits or in the creative side of it or anything. He's always been the hired gun in the band, you know, and just didn't have an opinion. But yet, he was the guy that I can tell you right now was more of a flag bearer for Van Halen than anyone in the band. Like, you know, he believed in it. He had the dream, but he was never allowed to to come out and say anything. So I always fought for his bass solo. I always said, hey, if Mikey's one of us. If everybody's going to do a solo, then Mikey should do it. To me, the drum solo was more boring than anything in the world, man. Alex's drum solo was 25 minutes long sometimes. That's, <laughs> that's when I used to take a nap, man, because it's just too long. I mean, you know... A, a drum solo should be a short little thing, you know, just right. a couple splash, a couple licks, and get out of there. I, Plus, Mikey was one of the Tres Cusanos brothers, so I can't, I can't bad rap him. Tell me what that is. I don't know what that is. Los Tres Cusanos, the three worms that we oh. we played at the Cabo Wobble for my birthday bash. Oh, okay. okay. It was him and I and David Lauser, who's David Lauser's in my band now. Okay. And uh, so Los Tres Cusanos, you know, you can't talk about one of your brother worms. That's okay. <laughs> Since you've convinced me to go back and, and re-listen to the record, what are the two or three songs that are absolutely the standouts? Uh, for me, you know, every song is great. And of course, you've heard Little White Lie so much. But oh, I yeah. love Little White Lie. I think that's really a unique song. But I think a song like Who Has the Right, Would You Do It For Free, Both Sides Now, mm -hmm. and Amnesty Is Granted. Honestly, I just think every song is fabulous. I mean, Kama, of course, to me, is probably the most fantastic song I've ever written about my daughter. Her name is Kema, which means love in Sanskrit. That song is pretty special, not just because it's about her, but because lyrically, for love to mean, Kema to mean love in Sanskrit, and then if you listen to the words way, it's a nice little twist. I think poetically and even just philosophically, it's uh, probably the greatest thing I've ever done. And of course, March to Mars, I think it's a masterpiece. <laughs> I mean, Mickey Hart. Put 96 tracks of percussion on that song. You'd never even hear it. Every every part on there, except my guitar part and my bass. I play the bass and the guitar in it. All the rest of the parts are done by him on weird little instruments, like picking up a piece of steel and bashing it against a wall. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting uh, combination of people. Did you know Mickey Hart beforehand? I met him on a plane going to Hawaii when this whole thing came down with the guys and about two weeks later I said I'm getting the fuck out of town because everybody was bugging me about what happened what happened what happened I didn't want to talk about it yet because I didn't know quite what happened he was on a plane with me and uh, he, he's the guy that convinced me to go right into the studio and start writing and everything because he was talking about when Jerry Garcia died how you know he was lost for a few weeks and he said and as soon as he jumped back into the music that's when he found himself and knew that you know, he was going to be okay, but he said he was just totally lost. And I can imagine the dead. He was in that band when he was 14 years old. You know, they were like, they never stopped from, from then until now. So he was devastated. And so he really convinced me to just get right back into it and turn all that into positive and blah, blah, blah. He, he became a good friend. So you took it right right away and you just went out and, and did the record, huh? Well, to be honest with you, he forced me. I, I, he was going to Maui as well. And uh, so I live over there part time. And so I, was at, I gave him my phone number. He calls me up, I mean, that night and says, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, well, just, I'm kicking back, you know, that's what I came here for. He comes over, and he I swear, he stayed with me for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Him and his family, we, we just hung out 24 hours a day. And, man, you know, the guy, so I don't know if you know Mickey, but he's, just a little bit. he's the most intense, energetic person you'll ever meet in your life. So he, 
he just kept forcing me to listen to music. Hey, have you heard this group, man? Hey, check this out. He's into all these weird kinds of music, and it's real enlightening and very uh, inspirational to hear something so different. You go, wow, you know, that is cool. He got me all inspired and got me going. Next thing I knew, I was there for two weeks. I was going to be there for the whole rest of the year. You know, I was just going to let wait till my baby was about a year old, and then I was going to decide what I wanted to do. And, man, uh, two weeks later, here, him and I are back on an airplane with the families <clears throat> coming back to his house now in Marin County, where, you know, I, I mainly live in, in Mill Valley. And uh, him and I are in the studio every day, just writing and jamming. So what are the plans? How long are you out on the road, and then what do you do? Well, I'm going to work this record a long time because, uh, number one, I'm so proud of it, and I think it's I'm, I've really got to go out and reconnect with my fans. So I'm playing every little town that has a three, 4,000-seat theater. That's what I'm doing. I'm not looking to jump into arenas. I'm not looking to open for anyone, you know, you two or anybody else. You know, I'm looking for doing my thing uncompromised, total self-indulgence in every little town. So that takes forever. It ain't like Van Halen where you just go, you know, you play – one town in each state practically i'm playing every little town so uh it's going to take a while and i'm going to, to the far east in october and i'm playing indian places like that and i've never done that before and van Halen was always too big to go over to those kind of places and while i'm not too big i'm i'm happy to do it i want to play uh, i want to do worldwide and so it's, it's going to probably be a couple of years before i'll start another record you know you were talking earlier about uh it's about 2,000 people showing up at a 3,000, but the, the competition in the summertime is just so unbelievable. I mean, there are so many shows out there, so, I mean, I don't know if you're feeling bad about the 2,000. No, I wasn't. I was just surprised. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I mean, the, the people's dollars are stretched so thin. Anyway. Well, you know, that's the other thing I'm trying to do is I'm I'm doing a break-even thing. I, like to, I don't need money. Money is not doesn't motivate me anymore. You know, of course, it did when I was poor, you know, I mean, believe me, and I was poor, but my concept here, what I'm going to try to keep doing for the rest of my career is I'm always going to try to do a great show. After being a Van Halen, you know, we spent millions of dollars on our productions, and, you know, it was always, like, big, but to me, it wasn't utilized right. We never had the right people working it, and we never had the right people designing it, so I'm, that's the only place I'm spending money, and then I'm giving the rest to the band, and I'm trying to keep my ticket prices down really low, and so that if if it's just 3,000 people, it's like, to me, that's, that's like, wow, that's a big crowd. This show should be the $75 ticket because that's what the show is. <laughs> and, you know, when you're playing for two and a half hours <clears throat> and given a production like this, this is a $75 ticket. But I ain't, I mean, like I said, I'm just not into that. It's, you know, if I ever go broke, you'll see me trying to get back in Van Halen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I look at it. It's like this is all about really just doing it, you know. After the, the Van Halen stuff happened, did you did you ever have, have uh, a chance to talk to David Lee Roth? Did you ever want to talk to him? Yeah, I wanted to talk to him because there was an ironic twist to this whole thing that is still the big mystery that Howard Stern, him and I, when I was on Howard Stern about a month ago or six weeks ago, whenever it was, Howard and I had a conversation off mic after, after the show about this because he, he's buddies with Roth, right? And uh, David Lee Roth claims that Gary Sharon was already chosen to be the lead singer in the band before he was asked to come back, right? Well, if you put your time frame together, David Lee Roth had been in the studio with those guys, had been asked to come back in the band two weeks before I was told. So if this is correct, these guys were fucking me around two months ago, three months ago. I don't know. You know what I mean? It's like as soon as the tour ended, I guess this new manager had this whole scheme planned, and they, got, they tried out Gary Sharon. I was told they tried him out in February. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm going February. I was in the studio for about four days with these guys in February, which we were arguing because, you know, it was like, I'm going, look, I got to get back to my wife. You know, she's about to give birth, you know, here. So if, if it's that ugly, I want to know. But at the same time, I'm going, God, I'm really let down. And man, these guys are shit. You know, what happened? I don't know what happened to them. They slipped out. So I wanted to talk to David Lee Roth, as you can imagine, to find out truthfully when they actually really contacted him because when i talked to eddie when i finally busted eddie's ass on it he told me well we've been working with roth for a couple of weeks and it's been going great and he, he he at least does what we want to do and and we all get you know have the same idea here you know we're gonna do a greatest hits record do a, a, a nostalgia tour or whatever and and then and, and i'm going yeah fuck you guys you know so but if that's the truth, now that is a bizarre twist. But Howard Stern, you know, he's a he's a troublemaker. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's a hard one to pin down. But I want to talk to Ross someday about it. But fuck it. You think I can trust David Lee Roth? You saw that clown on MTV. You want to trust a guy like that? I'm not sure what he would say. It'd be true either. But I'd hate to think that these guys were that fucking thin. But who cares? Yeah. Yeah, at this point. Okay, one other thing, and I'll let you go um, for another story I've been working on. I'm asking everybody I interview, if you were the overlord of pop music, what would be the first thing you would change? Oh, I would change the concept at rock radio. I would change the segregation of rock. I think it's really hurt everything. When I was growing up, when FM radio first was coming around, you would hear a song by B.B. King. You'd hear a song by the Rolling Stones, you'd hear a song by Led Zeppelin, and you'd hear a song by Percy Sledge, you know, When a Man Loves a Woman, or Otis Redding, or, you know, Janis Joplin. It was rock radio, and it's like all music was considered rock music. R&B and blues and rock and everything. I believe there's jazz, there's rock, there's country, and you know, classical, and you know, there's, it's, it can be segregated a little bit, but rock music itself has gotten so segregated that it's just crazy. There's stations that won't play Sammy Hagar, and there's and then there's stations that'll play Sammy Hagar that won't play, you know, some band like Tool or something. I don't know. You know, it's like, come on, man. This is rock music. It's like it, you're either a rock band or you're not. And I, I would change that. I'd say if you're going to play rock music, you play it all. And I'd rather that they play mostly new music, personally. Yeah, I figure you already own it or you hate it, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> exactly, man. <laughs> How many times do you want to hear a Stairway to Heaven, you know? It's like, come on, I could play it for you right now, sing every lyric, you know? That's right. <laughs> I've heard it. <laughs> so I'd, I'd rather they go a little heavier on, uh, on giving some new bands a break. Anything else going on with you you want to mention that we haven't talked about? Cobble Wobble Rules. <laughs> <laughs> It's still the finest place in the world to play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I really don't. You know, everything everything's cool. I'm uh, just I'm excited. Yeah. Well, well, I'm glad you're happy. I Do wish it. you had made music that you were pissed off. I, I don't know. I just would have been fun to hear you a little pissed off. But... Ah, shit, Mark, you're like the rest of them damn journalists. I should have known <laughs> before I made this call. I should have known. But, well, I... Now you come to this show and you'll see why I'm happy. You'll be happy when you leave the show. You're going to be happier. You're going to just be going. Shit, man, I really feel good. Yeah, well, your enthusiasm is always infectious, so I have no problem. I have no doubt about that. You know, I mean, I always enjoy watching you and talking to you and stuff. So, anyway, uh, I wish you good luck. I hope this works out. I hope you don't have to live uh, more of this stuff in the future, you know, that you can just go out and make your music and not have to answer the Van Halen questions anymore. Well, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. And, uh, I plan on that. Okay, I'll see, you next, I'll see right. you next week, Sam. All right, bye-bye. Tim Jack. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember you can always find more information Information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed.